Oh, hi, everybody. I was just, uh, welcome to another question and answer. Today, we, we have our usual uh, YouTube questions that I'm going to read and answer, hopefully, and, and also our Facebook, which continues to grow. Patrick, are you caught up with the, all, or Jimmy's caught up with all the people lately who have been wanting to join Facebook? Yeah, a lot of people in the last week. There, there were, how many, a half dozen or so, maybe yeah, more? Yeah, more than 10, at least that. So I, I want to do that, but I also want to talk a little bit about pricing uh, for you guys who have a, an upholstery shop or for even DIY people who are now starting to get paid for their work. I think you might be interested in just my slant on what's going on. At least in the Boston area, um, I was just reading this article about Boston saw a 104% jump in high income renters. I pay attention to things like that uh, because that to me, uh, the first the first thought is the cost of living has gone crazy in the Boston area. Boston is starting to get recognized, Massachusetts and the great and metropolitan Boston is starting to get recognized, especially Boston proper as a kind of like a European city. That's what I've been reading. And that, that I have to listen to this I have to pay attention to this stuff because it's really tied into pricing. And what you know, if the, my cost of living is going up, my expenses are going up in business. I need to go up in my prices. Now, the tricky thing about that is, a lot of people are stuck in this price points. And they get it in their head what they want to pay. I mean, I already lose fifty percent of my my inquiries that I get. You know, people just don't understand sometimes what the cost of a legitimate business. I'm an incorporated business. I pay my taxes. So, and I pay my rent. I try, and I try to pay all my bills. I try, I'm a legitimate businessman, so I'm not doing, uh, I'm not taking cash for jobs or anything like that. I want to stay that way. I think it's important. It's one of the reasons why our YouTube channel is very popular. It's honest, I think, truthful. We're coming from my, uh, a good place. So I, I don't want to, you know, send anybody else. I, I want people to copy what I'm doing, not doing anything differently. But I have a storefront. I have a storefront in a suburban area, right outside of Boston. Downtown Boston is 10 minutes from where I am. So you can get an idea geographically what I'm talking about. So I pay attention. This is interesting to me. It says, I'll just read a little bit. The number of Boston renters earning more than 150000 a year doubled between 2015 and 2020. Did you hear that, you guys? Who are in, talk, I'm talking to you guys, you, Patrick and Michaela. $150,000 a year, it doubled between 2015 and, and 2020. That That's amazing. So a lot of people who are wealthy are renting. They're not buying. They're renting. That That's an incredible, that's incredible to me. And the and we, we are seeing development going up everywhere. And they're, they're putting in, what are these, two bedrooms, you guys? One, one and two bedrooms that we see coming up around us yeah. that they're getting three thousand dollars a month for around here you guys out in the midwest might be surprised randy might be surprised at some of these numbers but this is directly related uh i want to just work out some my own pricing on a chair let's say a wing chair we'll, we'll use that as an example uh about it's just getting it's it, i feel with we're getting a little the knots are getting a little tighter here and i i have to pay attention to this and i have to get creative on how we can maneuver through this uh, period. Because if our prices are staying the same, which they have, have, when was the last increase we had, Patrick? It has, it's, been, it's been a long time. Yeah. We have not increased a long time. But if we increase, we know we're going to get, if we go down to 25% of the jobs we get, that's a problem. So we're in a kind of a bind. So, so I want to talk about that through, um, through the upholstery aspect. I'm not an economist by any stretch of the imagination, but... Uh, I think an economist can learn from a small business now, and even me. But I'll, I'm going to throw up um, a, a an example on this board once I get through this, so it should be exciting. If you guys have any ideas out there before I start that, what I would look for is if you're in a like Randy in his metropolitan Boston area, I want to, I mean, metropolitan Wisconsin or whatever it is, I'd like to know what what he sees um, out there. I'd like to anybody else who's in business. You know, please, like Malcolm, I'd like to get a, a feedback on what they're getting. Uh, if they if they want to share, if they if they don't, that's fine. But what they're getting per hour. Randy says, seeing the same thing time. here. Rents really? are lower. Lots of rentals being built. But the people who are, the who, people who are moving into these rental units uh, in Boston, I mean, usually I see renters as, as young couples just starting out, and and trying to you know you know go a little cheap. 
on the, uh, they can't afford a house, but they're, they're looking to try to save money. But around here, the rents are too high to save money for the average person. So, but where are these wealthy people coming from? 104% really got my attention. Well, and I'm surprised that it seems like people are officially moving back into the city after. This is post pandemic. Yeah, two years yeah. of people moving out of the city. Yeah, and one of the things, one of the interesting things is while those apartments have been vacant, the, the owners, the landlords, have been able to improve the apartment so they can get more for the apartment, Patrick. So, so they used, so this is an example of using a situation like the pandemic to get more money. A lot of people made money in the pandemic. We didn't. We were out five months without a single job, right, Pat? Yep. We were out five, maybe six months without one penny coming in. So we we'll didn't do make as bad money. as some people. We, we still in business. We still have our shop where we are. I mean, I'm happy about that, aren't you? We had some, some uh, you know, guts to do that, right? And some resources, not many, but we, we survived, right? Mm -hmm. And speaking of that, Malcolm says, did the shop rent go up? Of course. Yeah. I got a realtor come in. Listen to this, you guys. I don't even tell. I didn't even tell you, Patrick. She came in under the premise of doing two sofas for her client, for her boss. She said, and she wasn't. She was coming in to to fill me out to see if I owned the building or if I owned a part of the building. I mean, she got the information. She seemed genuine, and and I was courteous and sincere. I wasn't going to say anything, but she was a very aggressive person, and and then finally it came to. Well, I have to go back to the boss, but let me ask you, who owns this building? Is it blah, 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 blah? She asks all these questions. And, and you know what that means, aren't you, Patrick? Somebody comes in and buys that building, I'm gone. I'm kicked out. I saw it right in the next, the, the, apart, the uh, block next door had an upholster in it. Same, that, that happened to him. They kicked him out and put a yoga studio in there. Let me tell you what a yoga studio does to them, and I hope I'm not controversial with this. Believe me, I don't mean to be. Yeah, yoga is good for you. But what does a yoga? <laughs> what does it do for the? It has no effect on other businesses. They're not. They're not buying at the at the variety store. They're health conscious. They're not buying at the variety store. They're coming in and out. They take up all the parking, and they're gone. They're not spending any money or time or interest at all. In the local name in the economy, you can know you gotta pay. You guys who own shops like Blair, Malcolm, uh, Randy, you gotta really pay attention to to your neighborhood to see what's go, the dynamics that are going on in the neighborhood. And a full disclosure, I got a I got a baker near me. You know, I got a barber shop right next door. They've been great. They've been they've been doing great through the pandemic, and all that. They're they're a lively they're a lively bunch. Not my customers. My customers don't use, they, we never have any customers from the barbershop, Patrick, right? Oh, they're they're yeah, a different price matter. point. Yeah. They're a different price point. They're like a, like a uh, towny place, which is fine. But it actually draws energy, so it does, It does. It, it, there's energy there that's good energy. And then I got a baker who's in phase one of the, you know, God love, God love them. They, there's a, there's a, they might have somebody at risk, I don't know. But you, you're getting food passed out through a door in the, in, it doesn't do me any good, Patrick. I'm, I'm passionate about this. I want to. I'm not going to give the name of the baker or anything like that. I, I happen to like her. I think that she's fine, except that she's not doing any good for me. She's lining people up in front of my stop shop, waiting on their apps to get bread. That has. That's really detrimental to my business. But the social aspect is gone. It's There's gone. There used to be a nice little cafe Hang where people out, yeah, went in. Good. It's it's not gone. So you can't go I inside. Think, I think the ideal business for a neighbor would be an upscale bar, not a dive bar, but uh, people where people hang Listen, out. Listen, you know what the best? And they sit in the bar and they talk about the upholstery shop. The best, <laughs> the best thing for me was a cafe. Was a coffee place. Yeah, bar might draw the wrong. <laughs> but no, it was the perfect. I, I my students. I'm teaching classes now. They could go over and have a coffee. They could break away from the class. They could have a croissant. They could they could sit and, and enjoy a, 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 the atmosphere of what a cafe offers. That's true. But it's completely closed down. It looks like it looks like post. <laughs> it, uh, it's like a prison. Don't get me going. On. <laughs> I, I just I'm really passionate. And then I have a God love them. There's a little variety store that sells lottery tickets and things. It doesn't do a thing for me really. That doesn't do a thing for me. But at least there's some energy there. You know, it's it's not positive energy, but you know, people smoke, which is really bad for me. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I can complain. Funny stories about that. 
right. <laughs> I mean, I can I'm, I'm complaining a little bit, but I, I love my neighbors. But you know, if you're in a block, what I ideally what I would like to see, Patrick. I mean, then we have the caterer next door. The thing about the caterer, Patrick, even though she's closed, uh, she's not smells, a retail. It's the smells. Yeah. Like today, the smell from the caterer was coming off on the sidewalk. That's really important. Yeah, it smells good. Yeah, she's there. She's there, and I got that. Problem. You know this. They don't. No, I'm I the figured, one. So does, Who's, Rand, does Randy have a shop, a standalone shop, or is he working out of his house? I forget. I was curious. I, I thought he had a. Uh, I thought he worked out of his house. Uh, I was curious house. to know what their his block looks like. But if he works at it. So know. all of this is tied into how much you can get. All of this, believe it or not, is tied into how much you can get. How much you can get per hour? How much you can get for a piece of furniture? It's all added in. It's some of it's seen, some of it's unseen. <laughs> right? oh. Bar and laundromat combination. It will give you something to do while you're waiting for your walk. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> now, let me catch you up here. Um, all right. Well, Malcolm says I have, a, I have a friend in the Florida Keys whose overhead went went up a lot. Job. I would think that's like a big vacation uh, spot. The only people who are going to be able to afford commercial place of restaurants are coming in and out like that. I mean, the restaurants have a forget about it. I don't even want to think about uh, what they need, what they need to fulfill a profit in a restaurant bar situation. Patrick's a fan of this show called what's bar it called Rescue. Bar Rescue, yeah, yeah. where this guy <laughs> yells and screams. He goes in. <laughs> He goes in and try to rescue these places. He knows what he's doing, though. He does. <laughs> Some of them are making a lot of money, but it doesn't work for them. <laughs> right, <Fair. laughs> Because there's a lot of dysfunction in that business, I guess. I don't know. But, but you know, the, you really need to be almost a genius to be in business. I'll, I'll, I'll try to write it out to show you guys what I mean. But, you know, profit. You're in business to make money and to, you know, to have a decent living, right, and to be able to pay people. You know, you're not in business to lose money or, or, or to, um, you know, worse than that. But anyway. yeah, Malcolm said, I re looked at renting another commercial space, but the cost was high. And I rented a larger house and used 70% of the house for business. That's interesting. So he's, he's in a house. Yeah. It must be a, a commercial use, um, mixed use. Is that what he meant? Probably. I said he rented a larger house instead. Oh, I see what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. So he's still over. working out of his house. Yeah. Yeah, see. He said he had one he had to close up during COVID. Yeah, see, we, we've all got, you know, I had a friend. Got that was, lucky, you know. I had a friend that was writing a memoir before the pandemic, and she had a pretty interesting story, and I thought it might have been an okay memoir. But then after the pandemic, uh, I never told her, but I, I, I was thinking that out. Everybody can write a, a, have a memoir now about their experiences during COVID, right, Pat? Yeah. Uh, we have, we, we've all lived through something that was, was extraordinary. I don't know how you feel about it politically, but uh, extraordinary circumstances. And even now, three years later, I'm talking about Baker and, and what she's doing uh, and how it affects my business. It does affect my business, I, I'd be honest. Not, not in a huge way, but, but the, what's that word? I'm just saying it would be nice if you know, these things were just running running smoothly. Everything was fully running smoothly. Yeah, but you know, you know, look at the block. Not, not hurting us, but at the same time, it would be nice. But nobody has an interest outside on that sidewalk. Who's the one out there sweeping and shoveling Shoveling the snow and sweeping the trash. I had to do it the other day. Yeah. I had the cigarette butts. This, this <laughs> coat. I mean, I had to do it. And the whole block. You know, there's not one other business owner who, who wants to make the place look better. You know, it's kind of frustrating. You know, it, it makes you wonder. Maybe they don't need the money. But anyhow, no, the audio's cutting in and out. I gotta figure out why. Why is the audio going? cutting in and out? I don't know. But let's get let's get to some business now. I, this is my rant. I don't have my manifesto in front of me. Don't worry, you guys.
How is it now? Is it good now? Sorry, guys, we lost you. you. Didn't you didn't miss much? I was still ranting, and I said, uh, "Don't worry, this isn't a manifesto." <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't get that bad. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting though. Self motivating. You you really sometimes this energy that I have um, is the motivating energy. Okay, because I I I think owning a business for so long, and being I've been in a small business for over forty years. I I see I see this is a way of just you know, upping my game, really, and, and finding different ways of doing business, and et cetera, et cetera. But you guys probably know this. Okay, let's get to the YouTube, Patrick. Are we still good with the audio? Yeah, we're good. How to Upholst the 1860s Chair. That has to be one of our most popular videos. Marty says, I'm particularly enjoying this series because I inherited a chair like this. I deconstructed the upholstery about 50 years ago. Did you hear what he said? Wow. I deconstructed the upholstery about 50 years ago when I was 21 and decided I didn't know how to fix it. And it's been in my basement the whole time. <laughs> Did you hear that? Wow, For 50 years cool. he said it undone. <laughs> wow. Uh, Tinkerbell, real name, getting the most out of a yard of fabric was another video that was popular. It says, nice info visual. I'd be scared to have that lit candle on my cutting table. Yeah, you had, you had a candle next to the. I did. In the video, yeah. When was that? Why? I watched it to see what they were talking about. I Why could, was that? I don't know. <laughs> oh, I think I was demonstrating that if 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 yeah, if you burn, you're if demonstrating the, how to burn the shop down. No, if the apocalypse <laughs> happened and we lost all electricity, we could still work, Patrick. <laughs> I could get a treadle machine for the sewing. I can hand sew. I spit tacks. I still know how to spit tacks. You can see that video if you want, you guys. Mm -hmm. So you know we could we could we we could remember that time we went to Yellowstone and we did a little video on Yellowstone. Yeah. And all the volcano volcanoes blowing up around <laughs> us, and we've been in we we, we we pretended to be in Gettysburg one time. Remember? Yeah. You know we yep. shot being fired. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Come along way since then. That's right. How many are we now? How many subscribers? Twenty-two thousand. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Take a bell. Another comment on restoring a vintage 1950s Alf Svensson, Svensson, Danish chair. Good info. I've not encountered this chair yet. I wish the customer would have paid for new fabric and see complete restoration. I think that was a repair job. Stephanie says on how to make double piping. Thanks so much. That was invaluable information. Thank you for, for you know commenting on it. Debbie says, how to make double piping. Another comment. Thank you for sharing. Excellent video. I just read that, didn't I, Brad? <laughs> uh, Gabriella on how to use and choose trim. I've just got some old, maybe Heppel White dining room chairs from an estate sale, and the trim, GIMP, is coming off. The condition of the GIMP is very good and not damaged, and I was thinking about reattaching it with my fabric glue. But I was wondering if I need to... Some something to remove the old adhesive which looks brown darkened now. Should I just try and switch it back or on by hand? I'm also planning to get a professional cleaner to come in and give them a good cleaning. Uh, some minor staining, and she has in parentheses, some minor staining mostly just smells a little dusty. Is it recommended to have them clean first and then do the repair? I never thought trim would be so confusing for me. These well likely these will likely become a project as some of the lacquer is coming off the chairs a little sticky to the touch even after wiping down advice would be appreciated so on the gimp um it you definitely do not and i wouldn't recommend try to remove the old glue once you put new glue on believe it or not that old glue will melt and it he and the adhesive of that would work nicely as a repair however that said it's very important the glue gun that you're using has to be not a, uh, a one of these arts and crafts store glue guns. Usually they don't work. But um, if you do find one with the high and a low switch in a craft store, grab that and always keep it on the high. But the problem with um, store-bought gun, I mean professionally, we, we have we have a, a glue gun on sale on the on the site, right? A Pulse yeah, on Broadway. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing about the site, upholstery on Broadway, all the supplies and the tools that we sell, they're, they're, they're kind of, I've used them and I, I've graded them as good for professional use. So these stores, uh, these craft stores, they sell a gun that won't burn you. 
it won't burn through your skin. Unfortunately, I have to say, a professional's gun will burn you very, very quickly because the glue that's coming out of there is a lot hotter than the glue that's coming out of uh, one of those other guns. One of those other guns probably have 50% uh, heated. And, and so, so I could actually take the glue from that gun and just shoot it into my hand and it wouldn't burn my hand. I would not advise you guys to do that. I'd probably put it on my calluses, but um, with my hot glue gun though, that will burn. And you gotta be careful with that. But that's what you wanna use for the repair. Because it will, it will take the other glue that's on there, the old glue, melt it, and then the repair would it'd be a nice repair. And then you have it clean. Do that first because the cleaner is going to come in and use his stuff. He might tear some of that gimp off. So be careful. Do that first. I hope that was helpful. Uh, any questions or comments, Patrick, before I move on? Uh, Malcolm says, new TV show, Poultry for the Apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Randy says in the upholstery show, Kevin, do do label your work in anywhere that is visible to the customer. Wait a minute, Kevin, do you label your work anyway that is visible to the customer? <laughs> it's a funny question because I have a funny story about that. We we used to I used to work in a shop where the owner, my one of my mentors, uh, he had been upholstery for over fifty years. And one day, for some reason, now he, he didn't know what a Sharpie was because he had never seen a Sharpie. He never used a Sharpie before. This was a few years ago when Sharpies first started coming out. A black Sharpie. So he, he, he thought he was okay. And guys, I'm just going to say this right off the bat. Your, your, your best friend is the chalk that we still have this chalk. It's a special chalk. It's an upholsterous chalk. It's available at Upholstery on Broadway. It comes in boxes. It's well worth it. It's a powdered chalk, and in most cases, it comes right off with a blower, with an air blower. It comes right off. But I always mark the back side of my fabric. I don't mark the front side of my fabric. So I, I use a powdered chalk. I don't use, I don't use pen. I don't use pencil. I don't use tape with pen and pencil. No, because tape falls off. I use my powdered professional chalk. Okay, that's it. So my mentor, he grabs a Sharpie. He has a wing chair that he's doing, and he and he marks the back side of his wing chair with his distinctive markings, which I could recognize. I've recognized this today when I take a piece of pot. There's a video about that. So he takes the all of the all the outsides, all the insides, the cushion, everything, and marks it. You know, front cushion. Outside back top, outside on top, etc., etc. So the chair came out beautiful, and I remember it was a hot summer day <laughs> when I delivered this chair to the customer, and she didn't have central heating back then. Central air conditioning was not even known. I'm talking 30 years ago, 35 years ago, maybe, maybe 40 years ago. I put the chair in its place. She gives me the money. She's happy. A week later, she calls. In a very panicked state, Patrick. Mm -hmm. uh, now, can you Google uh, uh, something for me right now, Patrick? Can you Google um, what year The Exorcist came out? The original Exorcist. What I movie? Think it was the seventies. This is very relevant. What what year was that? Can you look up the year? Because it's exactly that would be the year exactly when this wing chair was done. And I, I'll 73. tell you why. Seventy three. Seventy <laughs> three. 1973, Linda Blair, right? Yeah. With all the backwards writing on the, you know, <laughs> Red Room, right? No, that's uh, The Shining. <laughs> no. <laughs> I get my horror movies mixed up. <laughs> but anyhow, so the customer calls in a panic, and she's a horror movie fan, she must have been. She says, no, there, there's something very odd going on with my chair. There's backwards writing all over my chair. I said, calm down, calm down. I, I'll, I'll be right out. So I go out, Patrick, and the whole chair, the the choppy had bled right through the really heavy upholstery fabric, and it was all backwards writing. His writing all <laughs> everywhere. Kids have been joking that he's actually worried about that. What? <laughs> no, what would you think? It, it's unexplainable. All of a sudden, you're sitting in your chair one night, and the morning, next morning, you go in, and all the backwards writing in black letters is there. What would you think? <laughs> It so kind of I had to confess to her that this is what happened, that you know, and and uh, God, you know, who would ever thought something like that 
would happen, but that's what happened. We had to do the whole chair over again, but guess what? I used the pot of chalk <laughs> on that the <laughs> second time. <laughs> oh man, I'm telling you. It never gets boring around an upholstery shop, I'll tell you. Janine. Janine says the upholstery show live. Great question and answer, guys. Can't wait to see the ribbon chair finish. I, I gotta I won't talk about that yet, but anyhow. So that's the YouTube. Any questions, comments, Patrick, that we should catch up on? Um one thing from Nico, she says, would that glue possibly be hide glue? Did she say hide glue? No, no. Hide it glue, H-I-D. No, no. Our glue uh, is from our supplier, and it comes without even any marking on it. But I know it's it, that's another element, too. you got to make sure the glue you're using is proper. I tell you, if, if they switch, my supplier knows better now, uh, over the years that I've known him, which is 40 years, there's been a couple of times when he decided to switch his own sources, and it's always a nightmare. I'll, I'll give you an example. All of a sudden, I see a different staple come in. I'm using the staple in my regular gun, these new staples, says they're fine, and the gun's jamming up. And at first, I didn't know what was happening, but then I realized the glue, that they, they used too much glue, or the glue was a different glue, these staples come in sleeves and they're glued together, but the glue has to be proper and, and the correct amount for it to for the hammer of the gun to work and shoot out one staple at a time. Well, what was happening was the, the, the glue was too too good or not good enough, whatever the case, the staple wasn't coming out and the gun was jamming. And that this is a big problem <laughs> with production. So quickly change back because he must have got more than one complaint, I could tell you that. Uh, so you really have to be on the ball with your supplies, too. You have to really catch up on, on what's going on in the industry with new things and everything else. There's been some really good improvements, like with the gun. My BEA gun, is I, I swear by it. We have those for sale, too, Patrick, on the website. Yeah. But those those are a great gun. Never jammed. I, the, the one I have is probably eight years old. Has not jammed one time on wow. me. Not once. Well, these other guns, and, and that's not a, a staple issue in that that I'm talking about. Good staples, uh, but it, but the guns, um, these store-bought guns at these big box stores, these staple guns, forget it. They, they jam. As soon as they jam, you go in there to try to fix it, and then you have a, you have a, you know, a burr or something on the, on the hammer, and then your gun is never the same. Uh, the more times you have to go in to fix a gun, the more, the worse that is. The BEA never, never opened up my BEA once. To, to fix it. Guys should check out the Upholstery on Broadway website to see what I'm talking about. You get a description of that. But anyhow, any other questions Pat, before I go on to the Facebook? Um, then Malcolm just says ballpoint pens bleed through vinyl. <laughs> so see how I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't use ball. It should be, the only pen that's in the my shop is at the in the office where we have to do invoices. But other than that, not in the work area. Pencils even, I don't like pencils, they, the, you know, the tips break, uh, you know, there's no, no reason to use a pencil, I think, anywhere, anywhere either. They have their own problem. Uh, Dorothy from the Facebook, she says, I've taken this shell back chair down to the bones. Boy, is she brave. <laughs> shell back chair to the bones, Patrick. Wow. Um... Pretty sure she got the class, right? The yeah, my yet. question now is do I remove, replace the springs? The zigzag springs, I would say right off the bat, leave them, don't even bother. It's in good shape, but the horse here is glued over it. Um, I'm taking the online class specifically for this chair, and you had Jimmy remove the old springs and put webbing in instead. She can do that if she wants. I wonder if I should do the same. She can do that. Um, zigzag springs, you know, I'm not a big fan of zigzag springs, but um, it would be easy for her to keep them, I think. She could keep them. Uh, I don't know why we had Jimmy remove the springs, uh, but the webbing would be would be a good replacement, I guess, for it if you're going to put, put foam on it. That's one way of doing it. I mean, usually you can't change out a zigzag to a coil spring because the frame doesn't take it. That's probably why I, with Jimmy I did that. I wonder if I should do the same or just keep this as is and do the webbing in the back and the sides. They had cardboard on the arms and several old layers of fabric on the back, so my plan is to do what you did in the tutorial and add webbing in those areas. That's fine. That's fine. She, 
Let's do the same thing we did. She's got that almost looks like Jimmy's chair, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Actually. So she she's got a good online class there. She and step by step, I had a student today, and I was I had a little more time to to work with her, and she she is a got a real interest in upholstery, and she's using the old tack method. So you know I have respect for that. So it dawned on me, and I told her, I said, you know, i got a little bit more time, so I'll explain a little bit more to you. And the detail that I went into reminded me of the online classes. So if you're watching this and wondering what the heck we're doing, uh, what the heck we're doing is we got the YouTube videos, which are fine, they're free, we love it, we, we're glad we did it, and continue to try to do it. We've got the Facebook, which I think is a great success, another free thing for you guys if you're watching. And then... I think the upholstery store on Upholstery on Broadway on the website, it's a way to support us. I mean, we know that the pricing is a little bit, we have to check pricing again, by the way, Patrick. Yeah, I know. Because yeah. <laughs> we might not be getting what we should be getting. Uh, but we try to keep ahead of, you know, and try to make a little profit there. Um, and But the best thing, I think, the best value are the paid online classes. The time that we put into that. The editing. Are you, how are you doing on the editing on the wing chair, Patrick, by the way? Good, because it's going to be out by the spring. Um, we're talking, trying to figure out the timing of it, but so we should do it more towards the end of it. We're talking time. seasons because, you know, the class has been wrapped up for a while, but the editing is, is endless. I don't know how Patrick has a lot of patience. Michaela, their patience is unbelievable with these editing that they have to do. He's done a terrific so job. Them out. We just... Uh, when, when did the other one go up? That was the shell back? Yeah, in the fall, right? Yeah, I think so. So, it so check ago, it out. It? Check, I know. Check it out, you guys, the online classes. And you get those online classes through Upholstery on Broadway website, right, Patrick? Yep. Sarah says, my project is the red one. Just leave that up there for a little while for people to see. And she says... Um, top left pick I found it's not horsehair under the diamond tufting. But I want you guys to look closely at that diamond tufting because that's really well done. It's really well done. And let's get to what I'm not sure where she's going with this. I found out it's not horsehair under the diamond tufting, it's cotton. In that case, should I remove the button and upholster over the old fabric, or should I still remove it? Yeah. Well, if it's cotton, you got a problem with taking the old fabric off because most of the cotton is going to come off with it. So it's her line of thought. I, I like her line of thought so far. Let's just read more. Um, in that case, should I remove the buttons and upholster over the old fabric, or should I still remove it? Will the cotton keep its shape to do the tufting? I'm afraid it won't. Second question, instead of the redoing the three cushions on the seat, can I make it like the white sofa if I get the right foam for it? Why and why not? Um, so she's asking, can she take a three-seat sofa and make it into an upholstered seat? She certainly can do that. Um, but always make sure that when you do something like this, that your height, your seat height, ends up the same no matter what you're doing, it seems a proper seat height. And Randy and Mary Malcolm can, can chime in on this. should be about 17 inches from the floor. That seems to be proper, and it seems to fit most bodies today. I mean, years ago, I have a piece back here, you guys. Um, Patrick, can you, can you get this piece? It's an old settee, and I'm curious. I'm curious to what the height is on this one. I'm going to my tape measure. Uh, no, but I don't know if you can, they can see partially what this is back here, but it's an old, this is uh, at least 150 to 200 years old. Guess what? The height of this is 17 inches too. So um, maybe it's a reproduction. I don't know. I was, I was expecting it to be a little lower. Let's, let's measure this seat. 17 inches, you guys. So I guess I was right, 17, 17. I was a little surprised that the one on the back wasn't lower. Oftentimes on older furniture, that's what I see. An older furniture usually um, is lower. I'd say maybe 14, 15 inches. So let's just follow up with this. Um, so she says, instead of redoing the three cushions on the so, so I would advise her to go over the old, I mean, keep the tough thing. If you're gonna keep the tough thing, uh, and it's cotton, um, you know, sometimes you remove the buttons and go over the old fabric because 
Um, to take that off, um, you, she can't replace it with foam. She's not going to do horse hair, so she's she's it's it's not a bad choice. I wouldn't put anything on over over the old fabric. Just go over the old fabric. See how that works. Put a couple of buttons in. See how it looks. If it needs a little half a layer of day crunch, it's gonna be a little tricky to to do that too. But um, you might might have to do that if it doesn't look good. But sorry, that's the only advice I can give on that. Um, and on the seat, like I said, she she would have to um, make up the difference of that four inches. She probably would have to go to a higher spring because she's probably at number one spring in there. She might have to go to a number three or a number four spring to, to make up the difference and to end up like this. Um, she certainly can do that. Um, I don't know if we've We've got an eight-way tie video that she can look at, but um, that should be able to help her. That's what she would have to do. Or if she's going to be doing all foam, she can what she can just add to what's there. Uh, maybe a, a three-inch piece of foam and bonded Dacron, or or stabilizing probably would be a good idea with muslin and then and then cotton or bonded Dacron over that. But you know, I hope that helps. And that's all tied into pricing too, right? If she was doing that professionally, she would have to go over that well with the customer. Tell them what you're going to do. Okay, and the next one is interesting. This is from Diana. Uh, we're at an upholstery supply house today picking up some foam and that's, supplies. That's funny. <laughs> and these two guys were sitting in the lobby. <laughs> The first thing I thought of was like doing something like that of you and Jimmy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who's Jimmy and who's me? <laughs> I don't know. That one has more hair, a small yeah. one. <laughs> well, they both look a little Jimmy. scary. <laughs> You're the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I like the piece of furniture though they're sitting on. Somebody uh, make us a Jimmy, a Jimmy and Kevin one. So Dorothy, yeah, Dorothy says one last one. She says, I accidentally ordered three and a half inch webbing. It looks much bigger than what you are using. Is it okay? Or should I change? No, she's using the right one. Sometimes on camera, do things look smaller or bigger, Patrick? Because it's the same one we're using on camera for everything. I can see how maybe it could look smaller, uh, yeah. bigger. It's no, it's up. three and a half is what she needs with the red webbing. That's what she needs. That's what she got. Okay. I wouldn't do anything. All right, that's it for that. Um, any questions or comments? Because I want to get to this board over here. Yeah, Nico has something. I think she's going to post it on the forum. Oh, okay. I'm working on another ottoman, not attached, having an issue with the corners. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. You know, it's so much okay. So let's get to Michaela first. Michaela, do you have anything for me? Um, uh, yeah, sure. Working. There's. Only one that's asking for an estimate, so that's, okay. that's the first one. The first Boy, email. Michaela has not been busy which lately in the last how many how many of these, Patrick, would you say? Uh, four weeks maybe. Four weeks. That's scary, man. I'm telling you something's going on. To look into this a little bit more. Which one? Uh, the very first email. What's the name of that? Jean. Yeah, I already answered that, but for the sake of everybody. No, you didn't comply unless you called. Yeah, no, it's been it's been going back and forth on text, and that's probably okay. not going to be a job. But what about that Jan? She's got a question. Yeah, she only has a question. Let's let's read that one. I am learning about upholstery. I am a senior and a sewist who loves to learn, so I have tried my hand at several projects. On this last one, I ordered the Ultra Foam 2835 from a supplier and used it in the chair cushions. It is a boxed cushion. The cushion wants to bow out and flatten at the front of the cushion, right where your legs put the most pressure. I do, I do not use any curvies on the front. This chair originally had a covered seat cushion and the wood frame was attached to the chair. I removed the wood covered seat and strapped it with an elastic product. I can't figure it out. Is my foam too long for the box cushion? I have attached pictures. I know you are busy, but if you could just point me in the right direction, it would be so grateful. I hate to think of replacing the foam as it was expensive. So when I first started, I was telling somebody today, I first started in, in the upholstery world, um, 
you start at the bottom. Um, I was doing stuffing cushions, stuffing cushions for a long time. Now, when we when we first when I first started in the business, our cushioning was heavier. You know, in other words, we used spring and cotton a lot of times. And so the advantage of a spring and cotton cushion is that it stays put or it doesn't bow. The heavier the cushion, I'm not talking comfort, that's a whole different thing. The heavier the cushion, the better it sits. So does that, that makes sense. And you know, upholstery is a challenge because these are loose cushions. We're, we're dealing with loose cushions. That's a challenge. We're not talking about any, you know, carpenters work with everything that's fixed. You're, you're a carpenter, you're going to fix, you're going to make a bookcase, you're going to make a bookcase and a wall, it's fixed, doesn't move, and nobody sits on it. I mean, the ch people don't realize the challenge that upholsters have is that you're, you're making a, a product that people, it's, it's very functional, it, it, people sit on it, all different body shapes sit on it, so it's got to it's gotta hold up. As we go along, though, we, we went to foam cushions because there was a cost issue and everything else. I can still make a beautiful, heavy cushion, but it's expensive. Nobody wants to pay for that. So you, you are, they, they properly, they did a proper cushion. They used the, the foam that is proper. It's a, good, it's a good foam. I mean, but foam can only get, you can only get to a certain point with foam, but it's lightweight. Uh, uh, and, the, and the heavier density, the, the firm foam is even lighter weight than, than and you don't want to use that. That's awful. So the best foam to use is a medium ultra foam for cushion like this. By the way, I think this, I'll show it to you again. I think they did a terrific job, and I think that it's good to be picky, but that, that looks like a, I know that this, I know this fabric, I've used this fabric too, and it's not an easy fabric. But I think they did a terrific job. I think that though, they're being very self-critical, which is, which is good, but how much can you expect from, the, from um, a loose cushion from a, uh, an, a, fine, a, pull, a fine sewing job, how much more can you expect, really? So the other day, to give you an example of how I overcome some things like this, I insist that and people come in all the time wanting banquette cushions done, loose cushions. Nope, I'm not going to do loose cushions on a banquette. Why? Because you've got a rectangular table. Usually it's L-shaped, a rectangular table. It's a banquette. People are going to be eating. People slide all the way down. You know, loose cushions are awful. They don't, they don't stay put. I don't care what you put on it. As a matter of fact, sometimes securing it with Velcro and things like that makes it worse because the fabric, the cushions don't react very well to that and you end up getting a ripped seam. So that there's a lot of engineering that goes into this, you guys. You guys know this. So what I do, what I recommend people do is usually when somebody comes to me and they want a banquette, for instance, I, I, I know that they're working with the contractor. So I, I say, I, I insist that I need a half inch plywood pattern. It's going to fit your Utah, the Utah contractor. This is going to be a cushion that's going to go over this, so it has to be exact. And so they'll bring me, I have two that are in the shop now, a longer one and a shorter one. It's going to be an L shape. And I'm going to upholster it. And they're just going to put it down, maybe put a piece of Velcro on the bottom of the wood. But I'm going to upholster over it, put a little base welt on it. It's going to look just like a cushion. Won't be reversible, big deal. But it's going to sit well and it's going to be functional. We're looking for function as well as comfort, right guys? But on something like this, it's a loose cushion, sits in between two arms. And the other previous uh, one uh, question about three cushions and making it into an upholstered seat, they're probably, that's probably for the same reason because the cushions are flopping over and the customer doesn't like it, whatever. So you can restyle something into that, sure. But you know we, we are challenged as upholsterers, aren't we? And uh, so go on, Mikhail. I think you would, is that it on that one? Yeah. Well, what should I tell them? <laughs> I think you should refer them to the question and answer. And, and well, how many minutes are we into this, Patrick? Uh, almost forty-five. So so uh, say you know the question and answer that was filmed today, whatever today is, forty-five minute uh, mark. You're going to get your answer, and it's an extensive answer. And, and that's it. I mean, that's the best thing we can do. And then we get a fan for the show, maybe. I don't know. Does that make sense? We do 41 minute mark. 41 minute mark.
Okay, I think I'll let Michaela finish up there because that's a mouthful. <laughs> All right. Okay. Do anything else on there? Or? Um. Yeah, there's one more uh, question, kind of like that, from um, Catherine. Catherine. I see C two G E. Mine, yes. Material product question. Is that not it? Mm, it's Catherine from February 11th. Okay. Okay, I got it. So you can read that. Mr. Kennedy, I love your videos. In a video called Padding, four years ago, four years ago I think, you showed the old horsehair padding and the inexpensive method of padding. I have those same chairs, but I don't know how to upholster them. You use a piece of plywood as a base for the upholstery, and I can't cut plywood bases, but mine don't have bases. Is there a way to upholster them with, with webbing across the hole and then padding? I don't know where to attach the fabric to the chair. Is there a video on adding fabric to those chairs? Oak dining chairs with a square hole in the seat. I think in this case, why don't we refer her to the uh, uh, Facebook page to post, if you could please post, or have somebody, if she can't do it, have somebody that she knows post that on the Facebook forum so that maybe people can answer that or I can answer that. I need to see a picture. I'd like to see a picture. I think that's the best place for her. And then we, we get a new subscriber at the same time, or to the Facebook at least. I'm wondering why we're getting more of these we never usually get emails like this. Usually people find, they're finding us through the email, which is interesting to me. I wonder why that's going on. Any ideas, Patrick? Oh, that's weird. It's all good. Uh, any type of response that you get. <laughs> you know, I used to be picked on a lot in middle school, and I used to think, well, at least, at least somebody's paying attention to oh me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got my hair pulled, or I got glue in it, uh, or somebody came behind me and choked me while I was sitting. I, I went to a very tough school. Pit. He doesn't know. Patrick doesn't know. I went to a very tough middle school, and I, I used to sit there going, well, at least, at least, <laughs> at least I'm getting some attention. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding about the reviews, though. Um, okay, so any more before I go on? <laughs> no, that's it. But you know, we survive, right guys? Uh, I want to go on to um, just this discussion about pricing. It drives me crazy because it's, 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 been, it's always an issue. And you know, here we are in 2023. First thing I'm going to write, Patrick, can you see over here? Top of the board. Yeah. 2023. <laughs> We have not had a price increase for how long? I would say five years. I see your head, but that's fine. What? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Five years. Five years ago was our last price increase. So let's use as an example, let's just see what our profit is. And I'm only talking shop profit. I'll explain that in a minute. Wing chair. Boston. Boston price. We just got through telling you that a lot of people are moving in Boston who are affording their average income is 150 single income, 150 a year, $150,000 a year income, and they're renting. These are renters moving in, renters. 104%, 104%. Meaning that there's not enough there's not enough apartments for these people who are making that much money. That's what it means to me. Somebody might correct me on that. So our Boston price, uh, wing chair Boston price, twelve hundred dollars. What does that mean? Twelve hundred dollars labor. What does it mean twelve hundred dollars? Well, I have a I have a shop. I I try to do a hundred dollars an hour. Hundred dollars an hour. How many hours you guys you guys figure that out? How many hours do I have to do a wing chair in order to make my price? Twelve hours, right? Everyone's saying out there, Wow, Kevin's fast. Yeah, I am fast. I've been doing it for forty years. 
I'll, I'll have a couple of cappuccinos and if everything goes well I'm not interrupted uh, and I stop from A to Z and I'm talking reupholstery, reupholstery not restoration, reupholstery meaning take the old fabric off put the new fabric on um, I, I'm shooting for, uh, was that t 10 hours or 12 hours, you guys? 12 hours, right? Come on, you guys. I, 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 12, 12 times 100, <laughs> 12 times 100 is what? I should know it, bud. Those zeros. 12 times 100. It's $1,200, yeah. $1, right? <laughs> you did add both zeros onto 12. Right, it's $1,200, right? The math question, I mean, I don't know. So 10 hours is $1,000. 12 hours is $1,200. <laughs> so it's 12 hours I have. Uh, Malcolm says, now that COVID is over, it's time to reevaluate pri pricing. I think he's rising. Right. He's Inflation right. rate is giving their customers a discount on labor, and that is substantial. Yeah, what does Malcolm get for a wing share? Can you ask him? I'll ask there him, Malcolm. Go. Please ask. <laughs> if you can reveal that, I'd appreciate it. And where are you again, Malcolm? And what's the name of your shop? We'll give you a little shout out if you do all that for us. <laughs> So 12 hours, it's going to take, and that's to break even. What, what does it mean, though? What does $100 mean? $100 an hour, I only get 50 That's my profit, $50 an hour. So my pro my profit on that is $600 is, is the hopeful profit on, on that chair, $600, okay? So what happens if there's a problem? What happens if somebody comes in? What happens if I, I uh, shoot a staple through my finger, which happens a lot, by the way. I shot a staple through my leg today. Um, so what, what, are you, what are you doing? What, what, what happens? So $600 an hour, that's what I hope to get. That's the profit, right? Now, that would be good if I get that. <laughs> what about fabric? Why don't we do... We, we, we try to keep, um, let's put fabric down here separately, but we, we try um, to um, sell fabric with our jobs. As a matter of fact, we almost insist that we have to buy our fabric. So, so eight yards, let's say eight yards of fabric at eight, at, uh, let's just round it off. Let's just say $100 a yard if we can sell it. That's $800. Uh, and we make, uh, we, we're retailers, so we make $400 on that. So $400 plus the wing chair, that's $1,000, right? That's what we hope to make. Doesn't It hardly ever comes out that um, on the labor um, that I can do it for 12 hours, I'll be honest. It, it's usually between 15 and 18, if I'm lucky. This is, this is top industry speed on a wing chair. Think about it, you guys. Start to finish, 12 hours. That's, that's what my goal would be. Never works out that way. And that's where you start wondering about the profit. So what is the real price? What is the real Boston price today for, for a wing chair? I mean, really? It's $1,600. That's, that's what I think, 1600 now, can I get $1,600 for a wing chair? Not all the time. My, my, uh, my estimates will go down. The percentage that I get will go down. So these are all constant factors, you know, in, in deciding about a price increase, especially. If we price increase, you guys, we might be in risk of not getting as much. So, so Malcolm Paul, he's in Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah, so which is a good right. area. Yeah. Nice weather, too. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't done a, uh, Malcolm's fine upholstery, so there's the shout-out, Dad. Mel Everybody visit Malcolm's. Say that a little slower. You do it. <laughs> what is it? Malcolm's Fine Upholstery. Malcolm's like Fine Upholstery in Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah. So Reasonable by, prices. Uh, swing by and take check them out. Yeah. And, uh, hasn't done a wing chair in a long time, mostly contemporary. Oh, no kidding. Mm -hmm. Wow. We get a lot of wing chairs in the Boston area. They're very, very popular. But anyhow... That's that's it in a nutshell. I, I just I just wanted to see what's going on, show you guys what's going on in the Boston area. Inflation is kicking in, like Malcolm said. Out post pandemic, it's kicking in. Uh, prices are go everything's going up. You go into a restaurant, not only are you are you going to be in the Boston. I don't know what it's like where you are, but there's tips. You have to give a tip. You almost feel like you have to give tips now. There, restaurants is one thing about box store restaurants. I think they have a real uh, uh, grasp on what what the cost of a cup of coffee should be Patrick let's say for instance they really have that they have a grasp on that why do they have a better grasp on on cost 
because I'm only a, I'm only a small businessman. I'm a small businessman, right? And uh, I have an accountant once a year or so, but I have a bookkeeper. But they have a team of marketing people that, that are figuring this stuff out, right? They're a very smart group and a team of people that are figuring this out for constant pricing but and, and contemporary pricing. So we're going to have to reevaluate this, guys. See what, see where we're at, okay? Not looking forward to it. I know, because <laughs> you don't like doing it, right? But that's it. I don't know where, where I was going with that, except to say that I don't think we're getting enough, uh, considering inflation, uh, considering the, uh, looking at these people, and that they seem to be doing better in the corporate world, for sure. I had a, I had a couple come in into the shop, Patty, who might be interested in this. They wanted to know, how did you survive COVID? I said, well, I'm here. And for five months, not one penny came through that front door, and we put all the money that we had back, and we reinvested it in the reconditioning the store, right, Patrick? Yeah. And they said to me, well, we're in corporate. We didn't miss a beat. They stayed at home. They did all their Zoom calls and everything else. They didn't miss a beat. Wow. Didn't, and, and, and isn't that wonderful? <laughs> good for them, not good for us, being a retailer. But uh, anyhow, complain all we want. That will be it for today, right, Patrick? Yeah, now things are going good. So oh, yeah. Good. I'm not complaining right now yeah. too much. <laughs> <laughs> You're complaining about the neighborhood. I, have, I haven't complained a lot today, <laughs> let's face it. <laughs> but it's all about self-motivating. Remember, sometimes you have to self-motivate in a small business, sometimes, all the time, I think. And I think when you were talking about the neighbors, I think that more applies to you know the classes rather than the custom. You could do custom work at a warehouse in the middle of the woods like uh, mm, don't the guy so in sure. Belgium there. No, don't be so <laughs> sure. We're a retailer, Patrick. People but like you know what I mean. It's... People yeah. like the retail experience. A lot of people shop around. They don't want to. They don't want to go up to somebody's house in his garage. You know, our price points are higher. That's one good thing about having a storefront. At least in our area. I think in yeah. other areas. Yeah. That that works a little bit better. But yeah. you can see how there's so many variables in this. You know, but you look at a box store like like Starbucks. I don't care if I say it. But they have this cookie cutter for the stores more or less. They they have they have a winning more or less. Uh, I, I don't see too many Starbucks going out of business. Uh, so so they have this winning formula that they have. Um, I don't know. Well, maybe we can use their, their pattern. I don't know. Their, their business model. But anyhow, I, yeah, I'm, right. I, I, I'm going <laughs> to sign off now. How long have we gone, Patrick? Uh, we've gone almost an hour. There you go. This is, this is a... Uh what is it? Uh, uh, how to how to run your poster shop part two updated today? I guess. Yeah, I guess so. You can call it that. <laughs> well, anyhow, thanks a lot for tuning in, you guys. We'll see you next time. All right. Well, oh, before we go, yeah, the ribbon chair. Any update on that? Well, the ribbon chair. <laughs> we've come into some difficulty on the ribbon chair, and the difficulty is the fabric. Unfortunately, Michaela. Oh, I thought we were. Uh, to go. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm holding my head because I have a headache thinking about it. <laughs> but the ribbon chair has run into oh, a knot. Okay. I'm going to call it my knotted ribbon chair at this point because <laughs> it's not a ribbon anymore. Because that fabric <laughs> looked like it stretched, and I I was very hopeful about it, but there's no stretch at all in that fabric. So we're having trouble with that. So, so we're not. What? I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to feature that in any other. Not when I have a trouble. I don't want to feature something that well, I'm. Well, I think they deserve trouble. a follow-up. Well, the follow-up's going to be when it's done, and and it's if you've watched the womb chair that I did, you get an idea of what I'm talking about. And that womb chair. Oh, where is it still here? No, I don't see it. No, the womb chair's behind my. No, the ribbon chair. No, the ribbon chair's been taken away. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I'm telling you, because I, I couldn't stand looking at it here, and I've, it's in the van, actually. <laughs> so what, you can't use that fabric, and now they got No, I have to use it, because, we, you know, we've already picked it. It's going to work out okay. Uh, I want to get a video. They, they don't, people don't care about that. They want to see the unusual no, aspect of it. You're no, just you're getting too worried now. can't work. I, the, 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 I'll it's, speed it up. It's not, no. I'll blur your face out. You're still <laughs> You don't understand. If you look at the womb chair video that we did, not the one over there, Patrick, the womb chair that we did a, with, a little while ago with yeah, stretchy fabric, yeah. with the a fabric that was appropriate for that chair, and you could see 
the panic mode that I'm in with that chair, because, you know, I've told this before, but every womb chair that ever comes in the shop, and we do a great job on it, but I look at it and say, oh, no, another one, and I always say, this, this is impossible. I look at it and say, this is impossible, but then I manage. And that's all about managing, using all your skills. Some pieces require all your skill. The ribbon chair, never seen one before, so that's a problem. And the fabric, I thought, Michaela, that was going to be a stretchier fabric, but it isn't. It's on a, it's on a mat, it's, it's matted on a very firm background. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, it's good for the durability, but not good for the ribbon chair. But I'm going to, I'll work it. It just requires a lot more hand stitching. But anyhow, you're going to see that chair complete. Sorry. Maybe we'll do a little video about our adventures on the ribbon chair. Yeah, at we'll least follow up. Right. Okay. All right, Patrick. All right. I think that'll Sounds do good. it. All right, see you guys later. Thanks, guys. You gotta be kidding me, right? What?